Stone Brothers Production. Hello, welcome back. This will be the final California serial killers I will be talking about. This video will be about five prolific serial killers, so I hope you enjoy the video and let's begin. Number five, William Lester Suff, aka the Riverside Prostitute Killer. Nothing much is disclosed on his early life, but he was convicted on an early crime of beating his two-month-old daughter to death in 1974. His wife was convicted on the crime as well, but the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals later reversed his wife's conviction, not finding enough evidence to convict her. William Suff was sentenced to 70 years in Texas State Prison, but only served 10 years before his release in 1984 on parole. Two years after his release, Suff began his prolific killings in 1986, and he chose easy targets being drug-using prostitutes in Riverside County. His method was rape, torture, stabbing, strangling, and sometimes even mutilating his victims' bodies. Suff also dressed some of his victims in his clothes before dumping their bodies. People describe him as a mild manner loner, and he worked as a stock clerk who allegedly gave supplies to the task force investigating in his killing spree. He liked to impersonate as a police officer and cooked chili at office picnics. It was alleged that he used a breast from one of his victims in his chili. His first victim was found by a local man in October 30th, 1986, and he noticed a young female wedged in a drainage ditch while he was scavenging for aluminum cans. The woman was lying on her back, clothes were ripped to shreds, and she was covered in blood, and her genitalia was mutilated. She was later identified as 23-year-old Michelle Gutierrez. An autopsy revealed she was stabbed multiple times to her face, chest, and buttocks. Ligature marks were found around her neck, and it was suggested that she had been strangled as the gruesome mutilations took place. On December 11th, investigators arrived to the scene of another apparent homicide. The victim was identified as 24-year-old Charlotte Jean Palmer, who was discovered near Highway 74 in Romolin. Her body was found 25 miles away from Gutierrez's murder site, and it wasn't apparent at the time that the two deaths were related. Palmer's body was so badly decomposed the county coroner wasn't able to determine the cause of death. Over the next few months going into 1987, he continued to dump near the same site. The task force trying to find the serial killer said that over the two years after those victims, the killer either stopped killing or found another dumping site. Two years later, they think the same killer started striking again by 1989, almost two years later since his last murder. On January 27, 1989, 37-year-old Linda May Ruiz, a known prostitute, was discovered on a beach of Lake Elsinore. The victim's head was buried in the sand and the autopsy revealed a large quantity of alcohol in her blood. Sand was also found in the victim's throat, and the cause of death was listed as acute asphyxiation. The body count continued to rise until the early 1990s. His most prolific murder was the death of Cheryl Coker, age 33, a prostitute and drug user was found on November 6, 1990, by a man working at an industrial plant in Northeast Riverside, not far from his previous victim. Her body suffered severe mutilation, and most shocking of all, the killer removed her right breast and placed it next to her. After the death of Coker, the Riverside Task Force had spent over $100,000, and they still were no closer to catching the killer. His death toll continued to raise in 1990 and 1991, up to 19 victims by that time, and his streak of killing came to a stop when he was stopped on the night of January 9th of 1992. Officer Frank Otra was patrolling University Avenue, an area known for prostitution and drugs, when he found a suspicious vehicle matching the description that he used was making an illegal U-turn. The officer quickly flashed his lights and sirens and called for backup as the 1989 Mitsubishi pulled over to the side. The driver by the name of William Suff appeared to be polite, but was transported to the police station after finding his vehicle registration was expired. He was interrogated for hours about the involvement in the prostitute murders, and he kept denying involvements in the murders. Police collected blood and hair samples from the suspect and arrested him for suspicion of multiple murders. Detectives had enough evidence to connect Suff to the murders of 13 of the prostitutes. 
On August 17, 1995, Suff was given the death sentence. As William Suff resides on death row in San Quentin Prison, where he awaits execution, he continues to maintain his innocence and claims police used him as a scapegoat. Authorities believe he is responsible for up to 22 murders. Number 4. Joseph Brigan. Brigan was born around 1850. He was a product of farming stock, and he followed in his family's tradition. He had a hard life working to earn a living from his private remote Sierra Morena ranch in Northern California. Brigan had not the greatest looking crops, which he showed very little effort put into his crops, except for his prized Berkshire hogs. He won many awards from his hogs at Sacramento State Fair multiple times. The pork from the hogs sold for top dollars at the fair as well, but many breeders pestered him for a secret for these prized hogs. Brigham didn't give up many of his secrets because his secrets were dark and disturbing, but he did say they received the best care and the hogs had absolutely the best quality feed. He made frequent trips to San Francisco, where he would find homeless men to come work for him on the ranch. These new employees would only work for a few weeks before complaining about working and earning more than just a place to live. Brigham would disagree and not stand for their complaints, and these employees would mysteriously disappear. What I mean by disappear is killing and chopping up the complaining workers and feeding them to his winning hogs, which was his dark secret recipe. In early 1902, his secret soon was found after hiring a young man named Stephen Corrad, the latest in a series of expendable victims, but Brigham's carelessness was showing with this worker. Corrad was checking out his room that night after being hired, but before he was about to lay down to sleep, he found two severed fingers on the floor next to his bed. The young man managed to slip away from his room and run away from the ranch to notify police. The next day, authorities went to his ranch and discovered a skull and various other human remains in the pig's feed. Brigham's time was up after that, and over the next few days, authorities discovered an estimate number of a dozen victim body parts at the ranch. Brigham was found guilty the same year in 1902 and was sentenced to life in prison. Brigham didn't live long in prison, though, and died the next year in 1903 but I am unsure of his cause of death because there is no information disclosed about his death. Number 3 Juan Viejo Corona aka the Machete Murderer Corona was born in Otlan in the state of Jalisco, Mexico in 1934. There is not much known about his early life except Corona he strived to follow his brother's footsteps when he left his brother Corona and moved to California. Corona followed the footsteps of his other brothers and came in illegally instead after hearing the money he can make in California at the age of 16. He picked carrots and melons in the Imperial Valley for three months before following the crops north to Sacramento Valley. Corona moved back to Yuba in May of 1953 at the suggestion of his older brother and he found work on a local ranch. He was also married to his first wife in Reno, Nevada the same year. Two years later in Yuba, a storm arose and tore a gap in the West Leaf area of Shanghai Ben, and 38 people drowned to death, which the flood covered 150 square miles. This left Corona with him believing that everyone died and he was living in a land of ghosts, and spent most of his time around this period reading the Bible. He gave up drinking and soon after was sent to a mental hospital by his brother after signing a petition because of Corona's acting strangely. He was then diagnosed as a schizophrenic, and he and his brother's relationship fell apart because of sending him to a unit and him not liking his brother's lifestyle after being a gay man. Finally, later in the future, Juan got a contract to control Sullivan Ranch, where he hired loads and loads of workers to work for him on his ranch while staying in a small bunkhouse to get themselves by. This is where Juan's sinister mind manifests onto his innocent workers who complained or some who didn't even deserve what came upon them next. Juan Corona throughout 1960 to 1971 went on a mass killing spree of his migrant workers. Although there isn't much to know about the victims, I can explain how he killed them. Juan always was in disguise with being a macho and having wife and kids. Although he was a sexual sadist and all his victims were men and sexually assaulted, 
That is why for the longest time investigators thought his brother could have been the culprit because he had molested and beaten the young man in the washroom at his place of the business. The victim was discovered bleeding by other customers, noticing his scalp was cut back with a machete. Corona was careless with hiding his bodies as he would kill mostly gay men by stabbing them multiple times and cutting off the top of the victim's heads and leaving open holes where the bodies laid to rest. A Japanese fruit farmer noticed a dug to large hole seven feet long and three and a half feet deep that had been on the Japanese man's land out in his peach orchard. He noticed it a day after and covered it and called police and they discovered Kenneth Whitaker with a homosexual pornography in his back pocket. Other victims of corona had slashes on their bodies resembling crosses, one victim being Charles Fleming, known to be a drifter. Most of the men corona killed were known criminals or unknown persons who were immigrants from other countries such as Mexico. More graves in the surrounding farms were dug up as multiple accounts of other farmers finding victims' graves in their farmlands. All the victims had also been buried face up and arms stretched above their heads, shirts pulled up over their faces. Some had their lower garments pulled down. One victim he killed was dug up and had a receipt from a meat market made out to Juan Corona, which made him a potential suspect in the case. Finally, he had been confirmed as an assailant because most of the victims' bodies had receipts made out to Corona. He pleaded not guilty, but all counts were finally indicted towards Corona in 1982 in his second trial after trying to plead for insanity. He was sentenced to 25 life sentences with the possibility of parole. Corona had been denied parole eight times, most recently in November of 2016. He will be eligible again in 2021 when he will be at least 87 years old. Number 2. Patrick Kearney, aka the trash bag killer or freeway killer. Kearney was the youngest of the three kids in the family and was raised in a reasonably stable family. He had a relatively good childhood except being thin and sickly looking, which he had became a target for bullies in school. In his teenage years, he became withdrawn, not having many friends, and had fantasized about killing people. Originally from Texas, Kearney moved to California after a divorce from a brief marriage and became an engineer worker for Hughes Aircraft. He claimed to kill his first victim in 1965, where he picked up a hitchhiker and murdered the person in Orange County, California. Also, Kearney claimed to have murdered several other victims before moving to Redondo Beach, California in 1967 with a younger man named David Hill who became his lover. The two lovers would frequently argue and Kearney would go out on long drives on his own. It was then he would find random young male hitchhikers or young men from gay bars and kill them. His first known murdered victim by authorities was an unidentified 19-year-old man in 1962. He took that victim to a secluded area on his motorcycle and shot him in the head before engaging in necrophilia with the man's corpse. He proceeded to kill many more victims in a similar style over the next several years. On April 13, 1975, authorities in California officially began the trash bag case when the mutilated remains of Albert Rivera, age 21, were discovered near San Juan Capistrano. By November of the same year, six bodies had been found in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Diego counties. The investigation not only dubbed him as a trash bag killer, but also the freeway killer, which the name was shared by two other serial killers, William Bonin and Randy Kraft. Kearney was very smart when it came to hiding his traces of evidence with forensic countermeasures, where he would sometimes extract bullets from the victim's heads after being dismembered with hacksaws in his home, and then disposed of the bodies in canyons, landfills, and along the freeways. Alternatively, he would also do another technique of taking the bodies to deserts to be eaten by animals. Also, he would drain some of his victim's blood to eliminate odors, sometimes even wash some of the dismembered body parts to minimize the blood and eliminate the fingerprint evidence. Additionally, he would beat some of his victims' bodies of some of the victims that resembled his bullies from his childhood to suppress his anger. 
Kearney's murder spree lasted from 1962 to his last confirmed murder on March 13th of 1977, which his victim's name was John LeMay, age 17, was shot to death and was found in a similar fashion like his other victims. On July 5th, 1975, Patrick Kearney and Douglas Hill were charged in only two cases, which both of the victims were slain of March of 1977. But the day of the arrest, Kearney led detectives to six dumping sites in Imperial County. The evidence was recovered from the lovers' home, included fibers matched to those several corpses and bloody hacksaw used in the dismemberment of certain victims. On July 14, 1977, Kearney was formally indicted on two counts of murder. His lover was released the same day with his charges being dismissed as Kearney shouldered the full responsibility in the slayings telling the authorities that he killed because they excited him and gave him a feeling of dominance. By July 15th, Kearney signed a confession to admitting to 28 murders, with 12 of the cases confirmed by police. On December 21st, 1977, he pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and received a sentence of life imprisonment. Prosecutors charged Kearney again the next year, in February of 1978, for an additional 18 counts of murder. Nine of those charges in Kearney's confession bringing his total to 12. The others included two children aged 5 and 8, along with four victims whose bodies were never recovered. On February 21, 1978, Kearney pled guilty on all counts, bringing his total to 21 and receiving another life sentence. His number is believed to be much higher if he is truthful about the amount he confessed to in his confession, and at least seven of his victims remain unidentified. Number 1. Randy Stephen Kraft, a.k.a. Southern California Strangler Randy Kraft was born in Long Beach, California on March 19, 1945, being the fourth child and only son of his family, who's all relocated from Wyoming to Westminster, California. He graduated from high school and went on to study at Claremont Men's College in Claremont, California. While in high school, Kraft was known to be a scholar joining the ROTC and demonstrating immense support of the Vietnam War and campaigned enthusiastically for the conservation presidential candidate Barry Goldwater in 1964. A year later, he started working at a local gay bar in his area while attending college to earn his bachelor's in economics while abusing Valium to ward off stomach pain and headaches in 1968. By this time, his political views changed and he supported Robert Kennedy's political campaign and joined the U.S. Air Force soon after, where he was posted in Edwards Air Force Base for his high aptitude tests and he was provided with high security clearances. He finally told his parents that he was a gay male and they stopped talking to him and he was forced out of the military the same year because of medical reasons and he resumed his bartending career. He then went on a diet of speed and beer, which he abused regularly, and his friends were surprised to hear about his new lifestyle and Kraft cryptically told them, There's a part of me that you will never know. This lifestyle consisted of sodomy and murder, which started soon after his leave with the military. His first known victim was Wayne Duquette, a 30-year-old bartender. Duquette's body was found past decaying. And crime scene investigators could not find any signs of foul play upon the body, and they listed his cause of death as acute alcohol poisoning due to a high blood alcohol level. This was Kraft's first entry in his diary. Referred to as a scorecard, read as stable, leading investigators to believe this was his first victim killed. Nearly 16 months passed before his second confirmed victim, Daniel Moore, in Southern California by the 405 freeway around Christmas time in 1972. He was 20 years old and was last seen alive in his Camp Pendleton barracks on Christmas Eve. He was found at 1.45 a.m. dumped from a moving car. He had been strangled and bludgeoned with bite marks on his genitalia with one of his socks jammed up his rectum. Three unidentified deaths took place the next following year. One found with a sock jammed up his anus like Daniel Moore. Another was fully dressed except for shoes and socks but he did have bloody slacks with his genitalia is missing and a rope scars on his arms. The last John Doe was found without a right leg and both arms cut, scattered across San Pedro, and the remains were refrigerated before being dumped. 
All other victims that were in Randy's victim count had hands cut off, pencil objects stabbed into the urethra, Valium overdoses, tree limb four feet long and three inches in diameter protruding from their rectums, and a lot more victims dying from the same sodomy acts that Kraft committed in previous murders. Investigators and task forces also have gotten his murders mixed with the trash bag murders that were committed by Patrick Kearney. Police caught onto Kraft after questioning about Carl's abduction and murder on May 19, 1975. But he had his roommate as an alibi, stating he was driving with a younger man to El Toro off-ramp where his car got stuck. When he went to get help, he said when, upon returning, Crotwell disappeared, and coroner's conclusion was that he died of accidental drowning. Kraft hasn't killed for 16 months after, although Kearney, the trash bag killer, was caught and they noticed Kearney never tortured any of his victims. This led investigators to believe a separate killer was still at large. Kraft continued his killings of over five to six more males and was finally caught after driving sporadically on Interstate 5 and upon arrest for intoxication they searched his car and found a victim named Terry Gambrell who also suffered the same fates as the rest. They also found other human blood on the upholstery of Kraft's backseat along with over 50 pictures of young men in pornographic poses. And finally a binder that had a handwritten list of coded notations where they found over 45 bodies of 64 that was listed in Kraft's journal. Kraft is one of the more prolific killers of his time and was sentenced to death but still is alive on death row as the case is still being analyzed because of inconsistencies believing he had other help of roommates and from other accomplices. I hope you enjoyed the video. The next state in the serial killer list would be Colorado. That video should be up by next week or the following week after, but I will send an update on my social media. Also, I am shooting for this weekend or early next weekend for uploading the next modeling and op video part 6, so stay tuned for that, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.